So today we'll have this conversation about European business, European governments, the issues that we're facing here, what is working and how to uh, move Europe further. I'll be, I'm very honored to introduce our first speaker, uh, Gilbert Gostin. Gilbert is a very close friend, but more importantly, he's the chief executive officer of Firmenich, the largest privately owned company in fragrances and number two worldwide. Prior to joining Firmenich, uh, Gilbert Gostin was the president of Diageo for Asia Pacific, but before that he was in the United States and before that in Africa and Europe. So he has gone through many different continents as part of Diageo. I think that it's also important to say that even though Gilbert somehow did not come to INSEAD, he was a very, very strong supporter, and still he's a very strong supporter uh, of INSEAD. Please join me in welcoming uh, Gilbert on podium. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just figure out how technology works, which seems to be great. Good morning, everyone. I am actually delighted to be here today, uh, and you will ask yourself, so why is he here? Uh, first, because I can't say no to Elian. Uh, as Elian said, you know, I'm, uh, I, I praise myself to be a friend to Elian, and I'm delighted also to be considered as a friend of INSEAD. Second, because as Elian mentioned, I spent five years and a half in, in Asia, you're based out of Singapore, running Asia before me moving to Geneva. And there was one Chinese proverb that you know, meant a lot to me, and I'll say it to you, not in Mandarin or Cantonese, but in English. And this Chinese proverb says, you know, if you want one year of prosperity, grow grain. If you want 10 years of prosperity, grow trees. If you want 100 years of prosperity, grow people. And this is exactly what INSEAD does every single day. And through these conferences, it's a forum for us to exchange learning. And I will definitely share with you my experience, but at the same time, you know, I will learn a lot from you know, these interactions with you today. The way I structured my you know, presentation, I have like 30 slides, uh, not heavyweight, and uh, you know, one two minutes video. I will run through them very quickly because what is more important for me is the dialogue and the Q&A that we will get together you know, after this interaction. And I structured my presentation in three buckets. You know, first, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about me, because you know, most of the time you know, they look at the leader, they don't look at you know, what helped the leader get to where they are today. Second, I'll talk uh, you know, about leadership in the 21st century, you know, how it is completely different from the 20th century, and at the same time, you know, where do we stand in Europe on this one. And third, I will tell you what we are doing in Firmenich, you know, the company that I run, you know, to make sure that we are more relevant and give back to the communities in which we operate. So let me start with the first slide. You know, I always like people, you know, describing me as a family man. Uh, as you heard from Ilian, uh, I, I was blessed, you know, to have the opportunity to work and live on four continents. But I did this because of my family. I've been married to Rula for the last uh, 29 years, the so same wife for the last 29 years. And together we have two children. And this is one of the things that I have in, with, in common with Elian is that my wife is an economist and she's a deputy dean of the uh, French University in Lebanon, the St. Joseph University. So I have economics with Elian when we uh, have dinners and lunches together, but I have them every day at home uh, with, with Rula. And uh, although Rula has a PhD in economics, she will also qualify for PhD in moving houses because we moved 20 times in 29 years of marriage. And, you know, the backup and the support that I got at home was instrumental in helping me, you know, become the leader who I am today. Thank you. Let me talk a little bit about Firminish. You know, I will, I will do it very high level. I know you could all go on our website and see what we do. But I'm very proud, you know, to lead a family-owned company, a company that was established 120 years ago. Actually, we celebrated our 120th anniversary last Monday in Geneva, you know, with all our shareholders by integrating a museum uh, of Firmenich that relates, you know, all the heritage and all the history of this great company. The only pitch that I will do is I will bring your attention to, to research and to science. Uh, 
you know, obviously what we do, you know, we fragrance and flavor, you know, the, the best brands in the world. And, you know, our business is a B2B business. And, you know, we support and work for all the big multinational companies that you know. But the only reason that I'm bringing this highlight on research, because, you know, we leverage science. And science is part of the DNA of our company. We invest 300 million Swiss francs every year in research. And we have 2,000 life patents. And, you know, we're one of the very few companies, you know, that pride themselves to have a Nobel Prize. You know, our previous uh, head of research, you know, received a Nobel Prize in 1939 uh, in chemistry on all the work that he has done for Musk. And since then, you know, we have accumulated another 34 awards, you know, driven by our edge in research. And I will tell you later how we have leveraged science in order to deal with some of the biggest, you know, world problems. Let me now move to, uh, you know, leadership. Uh, you know, if you wanted to think about leadership in the 20th century, what was leadership in the 20th century about? It was about two things, creating shareholder value and more shareholder value every single year, and second, inspiring people. So this is what you had to do as a leader. In the 21st century, you obviously have to create shareholder value, otherwise, you know, they will replace you by someone else. You have to inspire your people because, you know, this is part of, uh, you know, the job. But most importantly, you have to do three more additional things that are as important as shareholder value creation. And I will start with the first one, you know, making a difference to your communities. You know, how are you uh, giving back to your communities? What impact are you making in the environment in which you are you're operating? You know, what impact are you making to your stakeholders? And you heard, you know, Ilian saying, and you heard also Andrea saying, you know, about, you know, business being a force of good. And at the same time, the leadership uh, position that businesses are taking in order to make, you know, our world a better place. Then... Let's talk about reputation. You know, we've heard from Ilian, you know, lots of scandals, you know, have happened in businesses uh, lately. You know, some of them have tarnished the reputation of exceptional companies that has been here, you know, for centuries. And, you know, this is critical. You know, what about integrity? What about communication? You know, are you living by the values that you, uh, you communicate and you try to convey every single day, every single hour, every single month? And the third one is the constant dialogue. And on purpose, I have not chosen the word of communication and replaced it by constant dialogue because communication, you know, I will communicate, but constant dialogue is an open uh, conversation 24-7, you know, with social media, with NGOs, with employees, with colleagues, with, with government, with state organizations. You know, it's a constant dialogue to make sure that you bring all the stakeholders, you know, around you and to make sure you all move in one direction. And I think this is where, you know, as Europeans, you know, we have also an edge on this one. Let me talk about, you know, the word. Uh, you know, this is definitely the best time in human history to be born. You know, as you heard from Ilian, uh, you know, the achievements that have been done, you know, during this century are huge. You know, although this century is only 15 years old, you know, there's lots of achievements that happened. You know, Ilian mentioned and talked about, you know, halving poverty. You know, one billion people in the world, you know, have been lifted out of poverty. You know, halved uh, uh, child mortality. You know, 17,000 less kids are dying every day below the age of five. There have been significant improvement, you know, on, you know, dealing with, you know, specific diseases like tuberculosis, like malaria. Uh, you know, access to, to clean water, you know, in the world, significant improvement too. And I think this is where, you know, people, you know, live longer and healthier. At the same time, you know, the advances in science have been incredible over the last, you know, five years. Science advanced over the last five years more than we have advanced over the last 500 years, and all of it is leveraged by technology. So lots of inroads have been made in only 15 years. But the flip side of it is when you talk about globalization, a problem in one part of the world will impact the other parts of the world. And the first one that is very obvious and is very relevant because, you know, we're, uh, we, will, we will be in, uh, in Paris, you know, in 20 days, you know, starting uh, COP21, that is, you know, the most important, you know, climate conference that is taking place there. You know, 
the world is getting worse on, uh, on the climate, you know, rather than getting better. Also, you know, talking about some data here, you know, the last uh, 14 years, which were, you know, the first 14 years in this century, have been the warmest on record. 2014 was the warmest year on record since, you know, we have records. And October was the warmest month on record in the history of the world. So, you know, this is a global issue that needs to be addressed. And all of us are putting lots of hopes and rallying behind, you know, COP21 in Paris. And I'm delighted to be representing Firmenich on the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, sitting on the board with CEOs like the CEOs of Pepsi, of Nestle, of Danone, and of Henkel, you know, to make sure that, you know, we drive this agenda forward and make an impact on, on the world by addressing, you know, these uh, climate change challenges. This is a data point that is also very important. 2.5 billion people in the world have no access to proper sanitation. So they have to, you know, excuse the word, defecate in the open. And, you know, this is also a serious problem, you know, causes environmental issues, causes sanitation issues, and at the same time, you know, exposes these populations in the bushes for all the risk that is available there. Ilian touched on this one, you know, you have a billion people, you know, that are still, you know, hungry in today's world. But the flip side of it, you have a billion people overweight. A billion people overweight while, you know, we waste 750 million US dollars of waste food every single year. And just to feed, you know, these, uh, the billion hungry people, you just need uh, 80 billion of these 750 billion of waste to be able to feed you know, the people that are sleeping hungry. Inequality, you know, 1% of the, the world wealth you know, is, uh, is captured by 80 people that is the equal of 50% of the world wealth and population. As you heard from Ilian, you know, business is a force of good and business made an impact everywhere. You know, just take some data points from the US. You know, 40% of the US GDP is generated by companies that didn't exist 30 years ago. You know, take the data on emerging markets. You know, businesses in emerging markets, you know, generate 60% of the GDP, 80% of the capital flows and 90% of the jobs. And you heard Andreas talking also about the inroads that businesses are making in Europe. So business is a force of good, but at the same time, it's not only about job creation, it's about the impact that we will make in the communities in which we operate. Let me start by you know, making a difference in the communities in which we operate. And this is where you know, I feel very proud to say that European companies are taking the lead on this one. You, know, you could see you know, companies like Unilever, L'Oreal, Nestle and Danone and their CEOs, you know, being Paul Polman, you know, Jean-Paul Agon, um, Emmanuel Faber, or um, Paul Balke, you know, have made sustainability part of their strategy. And, you know, this is ingrained in their culture, and they live and breathe it every single day, you know, the way we, they operate, and it is embraced 100% in their strategy and in their structure. And it is being reflected in all the actions that they take across their organization everywhere around the world. Do you know this guy? I'll be surprised if you, if you know this person, but I'll tell you, okay, so I, I, I see uh, someone smiling and, and nodding here, which is great. Uh, you know, this is Lars Sorensen, and Lars Sorensen is the CEO of Nova Nordics, a Dane company. And, uh, you know, why, why am I mentioning uh, Lars now? You know, I'll tell you why. Do you know this guy? I guess most of you know, this is Jeff Bezos. Well, uh, I'll tell you what's happening and why I'm putting Jeff Bezos and Lars uh, up here. Uh, the Harvard Business Review did their CEO ranking uh, just two weeks ago, it was published. And historically, over the last few years, you know, guess who used to be number one? Jeff Bezos. Why? because the metric that the Harvard Business Review used to use was financial performance. And on financial performance, you know, Jeff Bezos and Amazon are up there winning and beating everyone. What they have done in 2015, they have added a new metric. 80% is still for financial measures, but 20% 
is around environmental, social, and governance factors. So the 20% brought down Jeff Bezos of Amazon to the 87th position, and these are only 907 companies ranked here. You know, you go down from number one to number 87. Why? Because Amazon scored 828 over 907 companies on environmental and governance and social factors. So this tells you something about the metrics are changing now. You know, in the word, yes, we want shareholder value creation. Yes, we want to, you know, financial metrics are important, but shareholders and investors are also looking, looking at what we used to call soft measures. They are now being considered as hard measures. And last, and Novo Nordics, that is mainly in the diabetes uh, you know, business, you know, ranked, I think, six on the financial metrics, but you know, over, uh, they overranked you know, on their social, environmental, and, uh, and other uh, you know, soft uh, metrics. So I think this is an element that is very important to take into consideration, that we are not being assessed against financial measures anymore, but we are being assessed against environmental, social, and governance factors, and the way we are giving back to our communities and the value we are bringing as leaders to the communities in which we operate. Let's move now to you know, reputation. Uh, also, Ian, uh, uh, Ilian touched on this one, on reputation. If you think compliance is expensive, try non-compliance. <laughs> well, you could see the rusted you know, logo of VW. You know, if you go back one year, you know, this was the company that you know, had beaten Toyota, you know, was the number one uh, comp car company in the world. You know, where is their reputation now? Down the drain. You know, people are talking about, you know, implication and, you know, numbers that are put out there, you know, somewhere between 50 to 60 billion, you know, euros or, or US dollars of, you know, cost between, you know, litigations, you know, recalling cars, reputational damages, etc., etc. You know, this is serious stuff. You know, what do you tell your employees? What do you tell your stakeholders? What do you tell your family if you work for a company like Volkswagen and you've been on the board? You tell them, I'm unaware, I don't know about it. You know, how do you handle this situation? Well, talking about uh, you know, pharmaceutical business, you know, JSK you know, also was fined 500 million for bribery in, uh, in China. You know, last week, Novartis, you know, Swiss company, you know, paid 300, settled with 390 million US dollars of settlement for bribing pharmacies in the US. 300 billion of fines and legal fees. Who do you think paid that over the last 10 years? Banks. This is massive amount. This is you know, bigger than the, the GDP of Portugal. You know, these are big amounts here that can make a significant difference. So moving from reputation, because I'm sure you know, we'll get to you know, deal with this uh, during the Q&A, let me you know, touch a little bit on the constant dialogue. As I said, it is not about communication. You don't you know, rally your troops you know, by uh, telling them, you know, this is top down, this is the marching order anymore. It's dialogue. You know, on my blog, you know, we have 7,000 uh, colleagues you know, working for, for Feminish in 100 locations all over the world. I can tell you on my blog, you know, beside the town halls that I do on a regular basis, I get questions from you know, some of my colleagues you know, challenging me on my strategy and asking me about you know, our remuneration you know, in specific countries. You know, how, what are you doing here? What are you doing there? I think leaders are, the camera is always on you. you know, people want to know what you're doing, want to question, challenge your strategy, and they want to understand. And this is why it's you know, constant dialogue and ongoing communication day in, day out to make sure you, know, you rally your troops because they want to understand, they want to buy in, and at the same time, they want to be heard. And I think as European, we're good at this because, you know, part of, you know, our fabric, we, were, we have works councils, you know, sitting on our boards in some specific countries. You know, we're always tuned, you know, to talk to NGOs and we respect NGOs. And at the same time, you know, we have created things that like self-regulating our industries where, you know, these bodies, you know, are also effective. But it's a journey, you know, and guess what? You know, the, the bar will be raised on this one significantly. You know, we need to keep as leaders, you know, be engaging more 
all the time because, you know, this is a prerequisite for the job. To, to wrap this up, you know, I'm moving now to the third section, so I want to tell you what we are doing in Firminish you know, to you know, bring more value to the communities in which we operate, and how are we leveraging science you know, to address, for example, hygiene and sanitation, health and nutrition, and some of the you know, big word problems. So I will move through these slides you know, very quickly so I can allow time you know, for you know, our engagement and our dialogue. So I touched on this one, you know, we will be participating in the COP21 in Paris in 20 days time, you know, and I feel very proud, you know, to be sitting on the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, especially on the lifestyle, sustainable lifestyle board, you know, to contribute in moving this agenda forward. And I am very pleased to dedicate the time, the energy and the passion that is required to make sure that we move this agenda forward. Uh, I touched on the... Uh, you know, the, the sanitation issue, and mainly 2.5 billion people who don't have access to normal sanitation. As a company, we've partnered with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Actually, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation came to us and gave us a grant of 6.5 million US dollars that we've matched with 6.5 million dollars from, you know, our internal resources to reinvent toilets in emerging markets and come with solutions, leverage our science and our knowledge, you know, to make sure that we cover malodor in order to make sure that, you know, when uh, these consumers, you know, have access to these toilets in the new emerging world, you know, they could still do so, you know, with the certain high norms of sanitation and hygiene. And this is why we're leveraging, you know, our biggest research center, you know, in New York, where we have our scientists, you know, working that have, you know, so much advanced on, you know, understanding, you know, how, you know, sensors uh, work in the nose and, you know, identifying additional receptors and impacting these receptors by blocking orders and, you know, enhancing other orders. So we'd come with a solution, hopefully within the next two years that can, you know, address, you know, this, uh, you know, world challenge. The second one, you know, we're using our test modulation technologies, you know, to uh, fight obesity. And this is why, you know, we have leveraging science here and we have new technologies that are already available that exist in the market where we could reduce 50% of the fat, 50% of the salt and 50% of the sugar while maintaining the same taste. And as all of you know, you know, we have acquired taste as consumers, and, you know, if we want to eat some stuff that doesn't taste good, you know, we have the tendency, you know, to deflect to, you know, more fat, more sugar stuff. But if I can still have the same pleasure and the same taste, you know, I will go for the healthier solutions. And this is what we have been driving, you know, over the last 18 months aggressively with our strategic partners. Carbon footprint, you know, you could see the ranking, and, you know, we're very proud to feature, you know, on the list of, you know, these, you know, exceptional companies and to make sure that, you know, we always, you know, raise our ambition further. You know, these are the 2014 ratings and I know the 2015 ratings will be out soon. Safety and sustainability is critical also for us. You know, last week our colleagues, you know, received in the U.S. Uh, the DuPont Award for safety, safety and Sustainability. And as most of you know, you know, this is the graal of the awards in safety and sustainability in the world. And we feel very proud of that. Our colleague, you know, Berenger, you know, was voted by the Ethical Corporation last month, actually in October, as the head of sustainability of the year 2015 because of her drive and passion behind our sustainability agenda. And we are also the recipients of a Campbell Award that is perceived as like the Nobel Prize also, you know, in this field. We are very proud to be equal payers because, you know, lots of people, you know, talk about diversity, but, you know, don't walk the talk. And, you know, we have been, you know, assessed for equal work uh, in, uh, in Switzerland, you know, that is, you know, our biggest employment base where we have 15,000 of our colleagues. And the second one in the U.S., you know, where we have the second biggest base where we have also an equal workforce of 1,500 people. And uh, we felt very proud that, you know, we came out where, you know, we are paying, you know, our female colleagues that do at equal cap uh, uh, capability, you know, the same job. You know, actually, they are paid 0.8% more than their male colleagues. And we have run the same research in the U.S. in our New York offices, and it is the same. And, you know, we feel proud to be walking the talk on this one, too. 
uh, you know, I need to apologize from Elian here, you know, because I realize that I'm in a, at an INSEAD conference, you know, and I'm talking about, you know, two other universities. But the only reason I'm doing this, you know, we have just done two endowments, you know, one with OPFL and one in, with Stanford. And uh, to mark our 120th uh, anniversary as a company. And mainly we have done this in the field of neuroscience and sustainability. And I know, you know, INSEAD is not into neuroscience, and that's the only reason that, you know, we went to OPFL and Stanford and we didn't go to INSEAD. But this tells you something that, you know, we're not stopping where we are today. You know, we're investing in these chairs, you know, to make sure that, you know, we keep, you know, leveraging our science and leveraging the intellectual power that is out there, you know, to make sure that we make great inroads in this field. We've also, you know, forced, you know, OPFL and Stanford, you know, to work together on creating these MOOCs for Africa. And as you know, MOOCs are these massive online courses. And the reason that we've done this with OPFL and Stanford, because OPFL are the biggest in Europe in MOOCs. You know, they have 750,000 you know, students on MOOCs. And Stanford are the biggest in the US where they have a million you know, students on MOOCs. And you know, we forced them to come together. And you know, it's sometimes you know, difficult to bring a you know, big you know, European university and a big uh, uh, American university to cooperate together. But they are doing this together for Africa and designing you know, French courses for, for uh, West Africa and English courses for, for East Africa, and mainly focused on the, on the world of sustainability and health and social entrepreneurship, because you know, this will help you know, uh, African uh, people and, and citizens you know, to raise the bar of their knowledge in this field. The last one I want to talk is about responsible sourcing, because you know, this is also part of our fabric and what we do for a living. And you know, we have 150 projects live in 42 countries in the world, and we source directly uh, you know, our uh, ingredients and our natural ingredients from 250,000 farmers around the world. And uh, I think uh, the best way to bring this to life is you know, to run a video that will show you what we are doing in Haiti, for example, for vetiver. And we are doing similar initiatives in so many other countries because, as I told you, you know, we are in 42 countries you know, leading these initiatives. And you could find most of the information on our website. So please uh, you know, uh, run the video. Technology works. Boisé, un peu fumé un aspect un peu terre. Il y a même des aspects un peu pamplemousse dans cette essence. En fait, c'est une des essences les plus complexes qui existent. Et ça me rappelle vraiment la terre. C'est un, un des produits les plus, euh, comment dire, primal. Venir à la source des produits naturels, c'est très important, je trouve, pour euh, la connexion que j'ai avec ces produits en tant que parfumeur, parce que ça me, ça me permet de comprendre mieux le produit, d'avoir une meilleure vision de ce qu'on pourrait en faire. Ça donne une texture à mon travail qui est différente et qui m'inspire énormément. La situation économique en Haïti n'est pas très bonne. Très peu de travail, beaucoup de chômage, donc un niveau de pauvreté très 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 élevé. Dans l'ensemble, ça va mal. Mais dans la zone du vétiver, grâce au vétiver, ça va bien. Vatokai, grâce à la culture du vétiver, la population a la chance de pouvoir avoir des revenus qui leur permettent de vivre. Firmeniche contribue par les consommations de produits naturels qu'il a, contribue à faire vivre 200 000 fermiers sur la planète. Et à Haïti, c'est très significatif. La filière vétiver à Haïti, c'est 27 000 familles. Donc, très vite, dès qu'on est sur place, même dans un simple rôle d'acheteur, c'est impossible de ne pas saisir la dimension humaine de ces filières. Le développement durable, c'est un win-win situation, comme on dit. Si vous respectez les gens qui font, qui font pousser la, la, la plante euh, et que vous respectez l'environnement le, où cette plante pousse, c'est que du positif. Non, c'est assez euh, spécial pour un parfumeur de découvrir la racine de vétiver qui sort de terre. Mais c'est marrant. T'as bien le côté un peu pamplemousse aussi. Quand tu sens la racine fraîche, 
elle n'a pas du tout le côté brûlé, tu sais. Elle a le côté très, euh, très vert, en fait. Il faut qu'on produise davantage pour permettre à ses créateurs d'aller plus loin. C'est motivant pour moi de voir que des gens essayent de toujours trouver des nouvelles tonalités, mais c'est aussi motivant pour les gens qui découvrent ces tonalités de voir des parfumeurs qui sont très inspirés et très motivés pour utiliser leurs produits. Et les odeurs sont plus séparées pour moi. Cette qualité, c'est une boule très ronde. Et le vétiver traditionnel, c'est quelque chose qui a beaucoup d'identité. Aujourd'hui, c'est la meilleure qualité de vétiver qu'on peut trouver dans le monde. Euh, c'est une essence qui a, qui a énormément évolué euh, au cours du temps et qui aujourd'hui est, euh, est très belle. Agricepla est certifié EcoCert, biologique depuis 2010 et euh, Fairtrade, donc équitable depuis 2012. Avec l'équitable, en fait, nous euh, accordons une prime de 10% du prix de la racine à chaque producteur qui aura livré sa racine à l'usine. De son côté, Firme Niche, l'acheteur final de l'essence, accepte de payer son essence 3% plus cher que le prix normal et ces 3%-là sont reversés directement à la coopérative pour des projets autour de la santé, autour de l'environnement, c'est eux et eux seuls qui le décident. Vous avez choisi tous ensemble d'utiliser euh, ces fonds pour la santé, pour des projets santé, le jour que nous venons entrer dans la coopérative, là, nous venons pile, nous venons un peu changement de l'environnement et puis les vêtements nous viennent donner plus et ça vient nous permettre nous rentrer pour pour nous faire les vaccins si nous nous à l'école, prendre soin au bas au manger bré à l'école les aux malades mener au l'hôpital, ça vient nous aider nous actuellement là. Maintenant ils sont vraiment beaucoup plus euh, proches de nous parce qu'ils voient les choses qui bougent. Ils voient les choses qui se mettent en place, ils ont vu l'école se construire, ils ont vu euh, les rentrées scolaires qui se passaient bien, ils ont vu qu'on les aidait, qu'on aidait les enfants. Et à, partir, à travers les enfants, on aide l'ensemble de la communauté. J'ai beaucoup d'admiration pour Flaminge, pour une compagnie qui va plus loin, qui s'intéresse aux projets sociaux, qui s'intéresse au bien-être des communautés de Vétiver, qui va plus loin que le business. Ça va plus loin un engagement qualitatif. L'équipe Firmini, je pense davantage au business for development, pas la charité. Lorsqu'une société comme Agri Supply, une société comme Firmini ont tous les deux la conscience que la survie de ce produit passe par la vérité des liens qu'ils établissent avec les fermiers, eh bien ce tissu-là, c'est ça qui constitue la confiance et celui-là, on ne peut pas le rompre. Et c'est ça qui construit des filières qui nous donnent confiance. Je suis assez fier en fait de travailler pour une société qui, qui a ce genre de philosophie. Et je pense qu'au niveau des produits naturels, c'est plus qu'une philosophie, c'est une raison d'être. I feel very proud to working for a company that you know, is also not only creating value for its shareholders, but at the same time you know, giving back in the communities in which we operate. In Haiti, after the earthquake, it was, it was not an easy one. And to convince the farmers you know, not to have their children you know, working in the farms and to say, look, we should not have child labor here, they should go to school. They said, we have no school. We said, okay, look, it's not our business, but we'll build a school for these kids to make sure they have a place to go and at least they can have a better future. So I want to thank you for listening to me this morning and I will turn it to Elian who will facilitate the Q&A. Yeah. Thank you. So we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, think about your questions. I'll start first. Uh, obviously, you know, you talk about leadership for the 21st century, but when we look back in the last few months, in the last few years, uh, we have seen mostly failures of leadership that appear in newspapers. You know, people talk also about successes, but much more about failures. Why do you think this is happening? I think it's a very good question, Elian. You know, I would say it's down to three things. 
you know, first it's, you know, human failure because, you know, it's people failure. Second, it's a culture in the organization. And third, I think it's lack of leadership. And it's the combination of these three, you know, that leads you to this place. And I think sometimes in European companies, you know, we don't take seriously FCPA and Anti-Bribery Act. Because, you know, people say, oh, Anti-Bribery Act is in the UK, so this is relevant for the UK. FCPA, that is the Foreign Corrupt uh, Practice Act, this is in the US, it might be relevant to the US. They don't understand that, you know, this is the way, you know, the word is regulated. And it's mainly people failure and, you know, a pandemic culture that is not good enough where people don't escalate because lots of people know about these things. So take the Volkswagen issue. Don't you think that there were people in the company who knew about this happening? Did they escalate it to the board? If the board is aware about this, they will deal with it. But maybe the culture is not a culture where, you know, this is escalated to senior management. It's actually, you know, it makes, it makes us a little bit uh, skeptical and cynical because uh, the CEO, chairman of Volkswagen, Martin Winterkorn, was number 21 in the Harvard Business Review top CEOs. And uh, it's... Uh, you know, it, it has destroyed a lot of trust, I think, yeah. in, in business when you, when you look at you know, how you can hide these things. Yeah. But actually, let me go on something else. Uh, today, the conference here is about Europe and European yeah. competitiveness. You talked a little bit about Europe uh, and some European companies. How would you link, what, what do you think it is the importance of leadership and good leadership qualities for taking yeah. Europe where you know, it should be? Yeah. Look, I think competitiveness is very close to my heart because, you know, this is part of, you know, our survival. And, uh, you know, Andreas, in his opening word, you know, talked also about, you know, competitiveness in, in the world. I think what we need in Europe, we need optimism in Europe. And, you know, we don't have enough optimism today. And at the same time, you know, we need to leverage our strength. Because, you know, when, you look at, when we look at Europe... Uh, you know, Andreas, you know, talked about, you know, Eastern Europe, Western Europe. So we have pockets of strength and big pockets of success in Europe uh, because we have the opportunity here to have, you know, developed economies and emerging economies and developing economies. The Scandinavian model works, you know, in Scandinavian countries. You know, you have countries like Austria, like Switzerland, like Luxembourg, you know, that have created their own ecosystem. Take Germany, for example, you know, they've created an ecosystem that works. So how can we leverage, you know, the strength that we have in Europe, you know, to make sure that, you know, the competitiveness of Europe, you know, moves forward? Now, if you look at the data, the data is not good. And uh, I'll just, you know, mention a few numbers for you. In 2007, you know, before, you know, the global crisis, 40% of the word GDP used to, uh, sorry, 40% of the word FDI used to be invested in Europe. You know, guess what is the number, you know, last year? 20%. So this was halved. Uh, if you take, you know, the global companies, uh, out of the 2,000 top companies in the world, 600 used to be European, you know, back uh, in 2007 or 2008. There are 400 now. So the world is moving on. You know, the world is moving on, and, you know, it's, it's a zero-sum game. You know, you don't win, someone else will win, you know, either in the U.S. or in emerging economies that have, you know, the level of ambition and the level of optimism that is required. And this is where, you know, we need this partnership between public and private you know, to be able to move the competitiveness of Europe forward. I strongly believe we have, you know, ecosystems and, you know, we have the fundamentals and we can take bits and pieces, you know, to make it work. You know, are we, you know, creating this uh, environment where we could foster, you know, startups and encourage them, you know, a la blah, blah, car, you know, to succeed and win uh, in, in Europe and, you know, prosper in the economical environment that we have. And that's what we owe to the next generation of leaders. You know, we have to create these platforms for them. Okay, excellent. Questions? There is one in the back. Yes, please introduce yourself. And uh, there is a microphone. Thank you. Um, Michael Hirt, management consultant and growth expert. Uh, Mr. Gostin, thank you very much for your insightful presentation and thank you for your impactful work. Um, we're talking also about leadership in the 21st century. And um, what I noticed with many of my clients is that uh, they are faced with disruptions, 
either internally created, as we have just mentioned, or externally created by the marketplace. And the question is less and less how to have the perfect organization, but how to have the right level of um, adaptiveness and reaction to change a fast-changing environment. And I would be very interested to hear your view about this and how you are um, uh, fostering this in your organization. Yeah. I want to thank you for your question. And you know, it, it is thought-provoking because you know, we are competing in a global world today. And, you know, there is a world for talent. And you know, if you want to win, you want the best leaders and the best talent. And the most talented people will end up you know, joining companies that have a great reputation and they have a great culture. So starting with the reputation first, it's critical to say, okay, these are the values of the organization, these are the fundamentals of the organization, and you bring them to life in all of your actions. So it's not only on your website, you know, they are you know, alive in all your actions every single day, and that's how you know, your colleagues you know, will become your best ambassadors, and at the same time, you know, will help you drive the cultural change that you need. And at the same time, you need to avoid greed, because you know, sometimes greed gets you into you know, embarrassing situations. You know, take the Tesco overstatement of you know, their profits, overstated profits by 260 billion, uh, million. It's driven by you know, the, the, the pressure of the city and performance, and where you know, we need to be open and transparent. You know, take the Toshiba scandal also that you know, it was similar in Japan. So where people need to be open and transparent to say, look, these are the challenges, that's the way I'm dealing with them, and people will be surprised how their organization will rally behind them when they show vulnerability and show open up to the challenges they have, and everyone will rally behind it to address them. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are two questions there. John. Uh, John, John Cutts, Palmer Capital. Um, you very kindly put up a statistic on the presentation where you said 300 billion had been paid in fines. Do you know how that money was deployed? And do you not think that perhaps as European business leaders we might encourage the recipients of those fines to invest a considerable amount of their money in the education of integrity? Because what you have described is in fact, a, in the case of uh, Volkswagen, the objectives of senior management were not linked to integrity. If you look at Bayer, part of their whole story as a corporation is to maintain, uh, maintain a high level of integrity. When Siemens paid their considerable fine as a result of their own misdemeanors, $100 million was invested in education to improve the standard of integrity and ethic. Now, this is an area perhaps where INSEAD could also play a leading role, but I think it's also important for business leaders in Europe to say, to the rest of the world, it is possible to be successful in business and maintain a very high level of integrity. I'm spending about half my time at the moment in China and explaining to business leaders in China that it is possible to do business in the world, maintaining a high level of integrity is something which they still find culturally difficult to understand. But if you stick to your guns, it does actually work but it requires a level of cohesion amongst business leaders. And I think the Europeans have a natural ethic which I question in America, which is a regulated economy. This concept of self-regulation is something that we've had to live with, as it were, culturally for longer. So is this something which you can identify with? Uh, 100%. I think what you're saying is music to my ears, and you're definitely right. You know, some of these fines, you know, a certain percentage of these fines need to be invested in, in education. Uh, and thank you for bringing this to our attention. Thank you. There was one more question. And uh, uh, before, I, actually, because you mentioned INSEAD, what we do, uh, there have been a lot of criticisms recently that business schools are not paying too much attention to teaching integrity or ethics. I think it actually it's very difficult to teach ethics because people have different values. But I think that in many cases what happens 
is that people make mistakes because they have biases and blind spots, because they end up going into a trajectory without really reflecting what they're doing. So what we're trying to do now, and I think that business schools are unique in addressing this. I don't think that in engineering schools you're talking about these things. But what we're doing is that we have these classes where we show them how biased their decisions can be if they do not reflect and they don't consult with everybody else. And I think that it's a very important distinction because sometimes when you try to preach values, people react negatively. If you try to tell them, look, you, know, you have to be consistent with your values, just make sure that you understand the implications of what you do relative to your values. And I think that that has been working relatively well. Final question, and then we have to stop. Stefan. Sit down. Yes. Stefan Wirtz, I'm uh, considering my age now teaching at universities in China and Europe, and it's exactly what you referred to, I'm teaching business ethics. Therefore, I thank you very much for the fascinating presentation. And I would like to ask the question, if we refer to Asian companies and European companies, American companies, and I take the fact that you're from Lebanon, isn't it interesting that we are talking about Christian companies, Asian companies? What do you think will be the contribution in 30 years by Islamic companies? And you lived in that area. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I don't think it's driven by religion. I think it's driven by ethics and it's driven by fundamentals. And uh, you could see, you know, all over the world, you know, in great systems, you know, where, you know, you, you will find failures and lapses. Uh, I think maturity and education plays a very important role. And your know, education starts at home because, you know, that's where you discover, you know, the do's and don'ts and, you know, what is the right thing to do or the wrong th and the wrong thing uh, not to do. And at the end of the day, I think as long as we grow up, you know, understanding very well that there is not a right way to do a wrong thing, we will be fine. And this is universal. Okay. Well, join me in thanking Gilbert for his Thank fascinating you. presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, perfect.